All right, great, we have the talk up. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Houston this morning. My name is Simran Singh. I'm an adult congenital heart disease doctor and interventional cardiologist based at Cornell at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, just to, it works, fantastic. I have no financial disclosures. So for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about the anatomic classifications of VSDs, in addition to the physiology and the clinical presentation of VSDs. Indications are when you consider VSD closure, and then the same thing for PDAs. What's the clinical presentation, and what's the indications for PDA closure? We're talking about post-tricuspid valve shunts in a different, as a slightly different physiology than your pre-tricuspid valve shunts. Though I think the really Herculean task of this, you'll have much more complicated lectures. The biggest problem is really who I'm sandwiched between today in speaking. Um, it's a really hard thing to try to speak with uh, Dr. Lin starting off. Dr. Lin is a, is a fellow brethren in um, adult congenital heart disease interventional cardiology. We've had a very similar track, and since we're both part of Weill Cornell Medical College, I, I consider him a congenital brother from a Cornell mother sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, for those, uh, the, the other picture on the left, you know, you know, that doesn't need a name, but Dr. Mike Landsberg is one of the most uh, esteemed and I would call him one of the godfathers of the field. And actually, he also is an adult congenital doctor, Huey, and an interventional cardiologist. So maybe we should call him father, daddy, you know, from this point on. So um, Dr. Landsberg. Thank you very much. All right, so moving on. Uh, so when we're talking anatomically about ventricular septal defects, we delineate the ventricular septum into four, four bases. The first part is the membranous septum, which um, exists right below, under, it's underneath the right and the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve at the base of the heart. Um, and it's the most common type of VSD, about 80% followed by muscular VSDs, which is the majority of the trabecular septum. It's the bulk of the interventricular septum. We often describe its location of the VSD by is it its anterior, posterior, is it mid-muscular, is it apical? Sometimes you can have multiple VSDs. We call the outlet septum at the point, uh, part of the infundibulum, which is next to the membranous region, which is where the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve kind of meet, and this is important to understand anatomically because the complications to each of these VSDs is very much on the basis of where they are anatomically. Finally, the inlet septum of the of VSDs is what Huey alluded to, is part of that complex of atrioventricular septal defects. It's part of the endocardial cushing, and we'll be hearing about that talk next. Now, part of the challenge, I think, when you're learning congenital heart disease is that when you look at the literature, there are 50 different names for every single lesion, and this is what makes things hard. And I encourage you to look at the guidelines for the ACCAHA 2008, which will be updated very soon. But just to get you a flavor of the different types of names for each of these types of VSDs, this is just a sampling. I could have put up several more slides with this. Um, so you, when you encounter them, you understand uh, what we're speaking about. I will also add that amongst the four different types, there's also uh, malalignment VSDs, which uh, can happen in the perimembranous region. Um, and, but, you know, and also in the infundibular region, I will say this, that those are usually linked with other um, congenital heart disease lesions, such as tetralogy of Fallot. And VSDs, simple VSDs in and of themselves, are the most common form of simple congenital heart disease if you take away bicuspid valves and mitral valve prolapse. It's, it's quite common. It's two per 1,000 live births. And, uh, but, you know, it does often found, it is often part of other complex congenital heart lesions. So when we're describing VSDs on echo, I do think echo is the gold standard for helping diagnose VSDs. I think you know, knowing where, in which views you see the different parts of the ventricular septum can be helpful. The membranous septum is best seen in a parasternal long axis view, where you're seeing the aortic valve, and that part right by the aortic valve entering into the RV is the membranous septum. Similarly, in apical five chamber view, um, the same part is the membranous septum. The outlet septum is best seen in a parasternal short axis view where you see the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve right next to each other. That's going to be the outlet septum, and right next to it, close to the tricuspid valve, is the membranous septum again. And finally, the inlet ventricular septum, you can see it in a couple other views, but the best view is going to be an apical four chamber where you see the tricuspid valve and you see the crux of the heart. And that's part of the endocardial cushing defect that we were discussing previously. So 
the physiology is as important as the anatomy. And what dictates what's going to happen with a VSD is based on the size of the ventricular se uh, septal defect and secondarily based on the relative resistance of the pulmonary vasculature and the systemic vasculature. There is all, certain VSDs also depend on the ventricular compliance, but those are really the two main physiologic principles to think about. As I was alluding to, membranous defects, because they're close to the tricuspid valve, they can often involve the tricuspid valve leaflet tissue that can actually help close them, but they can lead to secondary tricuspid regurgitation, versus outlet defects can uh, actually involve the aortic valve can prolapse into it, which is a little bit of a bigger problem, because that can lead to aortic insufficiency. Now, if, when we think about VSDs, we often divide them into small, medium, and large, but just looking at the two extremes, a small restrictive VSD, meaning that there is a pressure gradient between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Patients can range between asymptomatic to late symptoms. There is a higher predilection for endocarditis and shortness of breath. And just like Dr. Lin was alluding to, VSDs cause left heart dilatation and increased PA pressures. They can cause secondary right ventricular hypertrophy from pulmonary hypertension, but it is the pre-tricuspid shunts that cause right heart dilatation. So they're not classically thought to be RV, dil uh, RV dilatation in and of itself. A large or non-restrictive VSD where there's no pressure gradient between the LV and the RV, you will develop pulmonary hypertension that's severe and often fixed if it's not repaired within the first few years of life. And that can be part of that spectrum of Eisenmenger's physiology that we speak about. On physical exam, a VSD murmur, if you hear it once, you won't forget it. It's harsh. It's pansystolic. It often has a thrill associated with it. You can have a functional mitral stenosis diastolic murmur in association. And it changes when you change the resistance of the arterial circulation versus pulmonary circulation with maneuvers. Uh, in a large non-restrictive VSD, you're going to have mixing of blood. So you'll be cyanotic. You can be clubbed. You can have a heave and evidence of right heart uh, RV hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. And because you're non-restrictive, you will not have a VSD murmur. And that's an important distinction because that can help you in thinking about what type of physiology this particular patient with a VSD is. You know, chest x-ray can range between normal to signs of right heart dilation and pulmonary hypertension. And EKGs, same thing. You can see right ventricular hypertrophy and RV strain, depending on the severity of the lesion. And again, between the size, between small and large, we often, you know, a lot of people give numbers and millimeters. It depends on the size of the patient. We sometimes give the VSD size relative to the aortic annulus. But, um, and, and we talk about shunts in the cath lab on echo and MRI to define our VSDs. But if you remember, you know, the basic concept, a very, very large non-restrictive VSD is going to have a large shunt. It's going to be mixing versus a small VSD is generally going to be less than 1.4 to 1 QPQS. So when we're looking at membranous VSDs, uh, if closure is indicated, uh, and we'll talk about those indications, surgery is going to be standard. Percutaneous closure is, is definitely off-label, though there is a device being tested called the perimembranous VSD occluder 2. That's still in, pre in, uh, in preliminary stages, has not been approved. Uh, the, this is the parasol and short axis view. You can see color flow coming right close to the tricuspid valve from left to right. This is consistent with a membranous VSD. This is another membranous VSD. We're looking at this in an apical five chamber, and you see the left to right flow. Again, right below the aortic valve is where the membranous region is going to be. That area can bleed into the outlet septum as well. Outlet VSDs, uh, on the parasternal short, if this would be your membranous region, this would be your outlet, and you see it coming closer to the pulmonary valve. Uh, in general, while membranous VSDs, we don't always recommend closure. Outlet VSDs, we usually do because they can involve complications with the aortic valve. So often when these are picked up in childhood, they will be offered surgery at an earlier age. And occasionally we'll see these in adults in, um, because you don't, you, the last thing you really want is complications from the aortic valve and aortic regurgitation. Uh, this is, if I'd give you a different image instead of a uh, echo, this is an MRI of an outlet VSD. You see uh, a, the, right by the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve, a clear shunt flow. This was very small. This happens to be an adult. And this one wasn't causing any major complications despite its location, so this one we're following conservatively. Muscular VSDs, the muscular septum is the majority of the septum. Um, you can, uh, these, 
VSTs will, can become in multiple pairs congenitally. It's called, we call it the Swiss cheese septum. And they can spontaneously close in childhood. The majority will. But you'll occasionally see these in adults. And if patients are symptomatic, if they're having signs of left heart dilatation or elevated PA pressures that is reversible, then we do consider closure. This is the only type of VSD uh, that you can consider percutaneous closure for um, uh, in addition to surgical closure. Um, I will say, and the location can be anatomically described on where you see it in the septum. This is, uh, some of you might be familiar with post-MI ventricular septal defects patients. Um, thankfully, it's a very rare complication with people who have heart attacks that actually, actually erode into the ventricular septum, leading to a pretty large shunt. And though there's an indication for closing that percutaneously or surgically, uh, otherwise those patients don't do well and often don't survive. I won't talk about AVSTs other than to mention that's the fourth category because that's going to be the whole next topic, and it's worthy of about it's a worthy for of a presentation of its own. So when we talk about VSD management, uh, we're dictated again by the age of the patient, the defect size, and the pulmonary vascular resistance. Spontaneous closure happens often, so in sometimes in childhood, when they're first noted, they will watch the child as they're growing up to see if there's any signs of left, of, uh, left heart dilatation or elevated PA pressures, especially if in the first few years it may close. But if you have a large defect with a large QPQS, or if you have an inlet-outlet VSD and an outlet VSD with any sort of aortic valve involvement, then you would consider closure. Just as important as when to close is when not to close. You don't want to close if you have fixed severe pulmonary hypertension, because then you're changing the physiology of someone with, an, uh, with a shunt and pulmonary hypertension into no shunt and pulmonary hypertension. And we know um, that is not as good prognostically for our patients. Uh, you know, so if you have a symptomatic young infant who's starting in the early stages of pulmonary hypertension, most people would consider closing that early to prevent the development of pulmonary hypertension. If you have someone who's asymptomatic but showing signs of left heart dilatation, you can consider a closure in an adult or a child to avoid later stages of LV dysfunction and pH. If you have someone who's asymptomatic with a loud murmur and a small VSD but there's no signs of left heart dilatation, you generally recommend conservative management. You just watch and wait, and that's probably the large majority of our membranous VSDs in the adult side. And, but if you are involving the aortic valve, then you have to be a little bit more aggressive because you don't want to create a problem where you have to replace the aortic valve. And finally, if you have severe pulmonary hypertension that's fixed or Eisenmangers, you don't want to close these. You want to do pulmonary vasodilator, supportive therapy, and rarely when you see reversibility, you can consider it, but you often, if, if you, by the time we see them in adults, that's not possible. Um, uh, I do think surgery is the first line for, for, uh, for VSD closure in general, um, other than the muscular VSDs that we spoke about, where uh, surgery can be done safely, effectively, with very low mortality. Um, I think it's, again, you often our surgeons are doing VSDs in addition to the congenital heart defect, other congenital heart defect, but it can, you know, there have been many, many publications, both historical natural history studies and current natural history studies that show when you repair a VSD, you're really improving the, um, the long-term outcomes of the patient to age match, to nearly age match controls, it seems like, from this study. So as far as percutaneous, again, I mentioned that muscular VSDs can be closed percutaneously. It's the only type, and they are currently, this is, still in works, the membranous VSD2 occluder, which tries to, uh, because membranous VSDs are the most common, it tries to account for a minimally invasive way to do that. Um, this is an example of a muscular VSD being closed. That same patient I showed you who was in shock after his MI, uh, this is a, you know, a closure device there. And then we do occasionally close, uh, we will occasionally close membranous VSDs in this uh, off-label um, with percutaneously. And this is an example of that in a patient who could not get surgery for, um, uh, for other reasons. And so endocarditis prophylaxis, again, if the guidelines since 2006 have really been against endocarditis prophylaxis routinely, unless you have a history of it. Um, you just want good dental hygiene in general. After you close the VSD, you want to give endocarditis prophylaxis for six months. That's the general recommendation, whether it's surgical or percutaneous. And if you do have a residual shunt, you would consider doing endo endocarditis prophylaxis thereafter. Okay, so in the last few minutes, and I'm sorry, I've got only two, three minutes left, about, but I'm gonna talk about PDAs. 
So PDAs are about one in 2,000 children. Uh, the ductus is open in all fetal life, and it'll typically close 24 to 48 hours after birth. But in some people, it doesn't. Then you have a persistent patent ductus arteriosus. And just like with VSDs, it depends on the size of the defect, and it depends on the relative pressure and resistances of the vasculature. You can range between silent PDAs to exertional symptoms to left heart dilatation and pulmonary hypertension. Again, you also have an increased risk of endocarditis. You know, the problem uh, is that when you have different size, this different sizes and different shapes can also make a difference in the amount of blood flow that's going left to right in this particular type of shunt. And you know, when you have symptoms, uh, they range between congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, you can have widening of your pulse pressure akin to aortic regurgitation because you have part of your blood flow going backwards uh, during systole and diastole, which widens the pulse pressure. And you have a loud continuous murmur, which is the quintessential physical exam finding. There are other things that give continuous murmurs as well, but this is the classic one that you think about with a PDA. I will show you this. Does anybody know what this picture signifies in the audience? And feel free to shout out. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at it. Um, or you can text it as well, right? Will we get, will we get that result? So if you have a non-restrictive PDA um, and you develop pulmonary hypertension, you can start to get a change in the direction of shunt flow. You can, you can lose that murmur because you're no longer getting that harsh left to right shunt. You get, start getting equalization of pressures, and you can actually get reversal of flow going right to left across the PDA. But unlike a VSD, where it goes right to left, uh, a PDA drains past your vessels of your head. So what you can get, actually, if you check their blood uh, and saturations in the blood, you can get desaturations in the lower extremity and normal saturations in the upper extremity. And this is... Uh, Anybody for this? What's that? Okay, so good. So there are there there are hemorrhages there. That's fair enough. Uh, but this is differential cyanosis, is what I'm trying to show. That you've got clubbing in the feet, but the the hands and the fingers are relatively not clubbed and not cyanotic. This is blue, but that is a good point. I think she this patient had some trauma to the nails, but it does look a little bit like a splinter hemorrhage as well. Uh, the echocardiogram, uh, and yes, there is a risk for infective endocarditis, so you would be suspicious. You can see continuous flow in the pulmonary artery bifurcation. That can signify your PDA. And just like I was mentioning, the indications to close, class one are if you have left heart dilatation, reversible pH, um, and you know, some, sometimes we even talk about if you have a, a significant murmur and a PDA, the Canadian guidelines say you should close it. Uh, now, this is, this is questionable. I will say that endocarditis or any history of endoarteritis, that is a definite indication to close, whether it's surgical or percutaneous. And I think that's important. And often, um, I see a couple patients coming every year who've had endocarditis, where even a small PDA I would recommend closure for. Um, so, you know, we do close both surgically and percutaneously, and I'd say the majority of children, if it can be done percutaneously, and adults, we generally offer it that way because you can get a pretty um, outstanding result and do it very safely. So to conclude, uh, VSD and PDA physiology is largely dictated by uh, defect size and relative vascular resistance. The spectrum of clinical presentations really ranges depending on the anatomy and physiology from asymptomatic all the way to the spectrum of severe pulmonary hypertension. Echo is the primary modality diagnosed, so there is a utility for MRI and for cath in measuring hemodynamics. And finally, both uh, surgery for all types of VSDs and PDA is an excellent option, and percutaneous solutions are available for PDAs and for muscular VSDs to close them when indicated. Thanks a lot.